hey everyone, this lesson is on premature ventricular contractions or premature ventricular complexes, otherwise known as PVCs. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about what these are. We're also gonna talk about what are some of the common triggers and risk factors for having these. We're also gonna talk about how we can make the diagnosis by looking at an ECG and what we can do to manage and treat it along with some of the complications of having PVCs. PVCs are a very common arrhythmia. They are also known as ventricular premature beats or V. PBs. And what they are is they are an early or premature beat that fires autonomously from a ventricular focus. So there's an area of the ventricle that fires autonomously away or outside of the normal firing from the SA node. And what happens is this firing or this depolarization will spread to the other ventricle as well. So here are a couple of ECGs that show what a PVC looks like. PVCs can occur in patients with or without structural heart disease. They are in fact very common in the general population. Over 50% of healthy patients who are hooked up to a 24-hour Holter monitor have been shown to have PVCs. But what happens is PVCs occurring more than 20% of all heartbeats only occurs in about 2% of healthy patients. And there are higher rates of PVCs in older patients and in patients with certain comorbidities. We're going to talk about some of these comorbidities in the next couple of slides. And we consider PVCs normal if there are less than 500 PVCs every 24 hours. So quite a few before we actually become very worried about what these PVCs are. But there's also a few other considerations we get concerned about PVCs and we're going to talk about some of those later on as well. So PVCs are often benign but can be a sign of underlying cardiac condition. So although many, many people have PVCs at certain times in their life or at certain times during the day, they can be a sign of an underlying cardiac condition. So we always have to have this in the back of our minds as well. But I just want you to think about PVCs are a very common arrhythmia, but there are certain circumstances when we want to be concerned about an underlying cardiac condition. I'm going to talk about more about this later on. So what are some of the triggers and causes of PVCs? There are a lot of triggers and causes of PVCs. So we're going to break it down into cardiac conditions, non-cardiac conditions, and medications and substances. So with regards to cardiac conditions that can cause PVCs, PVCs. Some of these include structural changes to the heart, including hypertension-induced left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH. So hypertension can cause PVCs through its ability to induce left ventricular hypertrophy, or an enlargement of the left ventricle. We can also see it in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy as well. So concentric hypertrophy and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy can increase the likelihood of having PVCs. Other congenital heart diseases as well can lead to having more PVCs. Having an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack can lead to issues with arrhythmias after that heart attack. So PVCs are one of these arrhythmias that can happen. Having an infection of the heart muscle itself, so myocarditis can lead to PVCs. Congestive heart failure can lead to PVCs as well. Idiopathic ventricular tachycardia, so this particular arrhythmia can lead itself to having PVCs, and ARVC, or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, can also lead to PVCs as well. So with regards to non-cardiac conditions that cause PVCs, we can see endocrinopathy, so issues in the endocrine system can lead to a non-cardiac induced cause of PVCs. These include hyper and hypothyroidism. So thyroid diseases in general can increase the triggering of PVCs. We can see this also in adrenal disorders as well and gonadal disorders. So hypo and hypergonadism can cause PVCs. Electrolyte abnormalities can lead to triggering of PVCs as well, particularly hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So hypokalemia is having a low concentration of potassium in the blood and hypomagnesemia is having a low concentration of magnesium in the blood. These both can lead to increased PVCs as well. Hypoxia, so conditions that cause hypoxia can lead to PVCs. Some of these include chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, sleep apnea, and pulmonary hypertension. These can all lead to increased prevalence of PVCs. And the last category is medications and substances. This is the one I really want you to focus on because a lot of these we can actually correct. So some medications that can lead to triggering of PVCs include certain beta blockers, antihistamines, and decongestants. Stimulants can also cause PVC. So illicit substances like cocaine and amphetamines can increase having PVCs. Caffeine can lead to having PVCs as well. So if you were to drink a lot of coffee, have a lot of caffeine intake, you can actually increase trigger 
triggering of PVCs. And we can also see this in nicotine and alcohol. So the last three here are some of the more easily modifiable causes of PVCs, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. So a lot of times, as we mentioned before, many individuals that are healthy can have PVCs and a lot of times they can be triggered by these last three, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. So we want to modify our risk factors. We wanna modify the triggers for PVCs. We wanna to try to avoid having caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. So what are some of the clinical features of PVCs? Most are often asymptomatic. So a lot of people can have premature ventricular contractions and not even realize they're having them. But some people do feel them and they feel them in the way of having palpitations. And they may also have some issues with presyncope or dizziness as well. So these are some of the only clinical features of having premature ventricular contractions. But what I really wanna focus on here is ECG findings. This is really what's gonna help us determine what a PVC is on an ECG and how we actually diagnose it. So here is a PVC on an ECG. So you, we can see this weird, bizarre, aberrant, QRS complex, and we see that there's no P wave. So here's a P wave here, but we don't actually see it here as well. And that is in fact one of the findings. There's no P wave with a PVC. The P wave is often considered buried within the QRS complex. So the P wave is buried in the QRS and we don't see it. And it is a wide complex arrhythmia. As we can see here, the QRS complex is very wide compared to some of the other QRS complexes here. The QRS is greater than 120 milliseconds in a PVC. And it's because of slower conduction through the ventricular muscle. As we mentioned before, it is due to autonomous firing from the ventricle focus or a focus in the ventricle. So it conducts through ventricular muscle, so it is slower. And this is what causes the wide complex. And it is often considered bizarre in its morphology. So it's a bizarre QRS morphology. As you can see here, if we were to compare it compared to this QRS and this QRS, it's very bizarre and very different. And it's followed by what we call a compensatory pause because if we were to measure the blocks between normal QRS complexes, so if we measure just roughly the big boxes between the QRS complexes, one, two, three, this one actually happens only within about two big boxes. So the PVC fires prematurely. That's why it's considered a premature ventricular contraction. And because it's premature, it has a compensatory pause. So there is a prolonged duration before the next QRS complex. So how do we manage PVCs? Most of it is identifying and avoiding triggers. That's why I talked a lot about triggers before. We wanna really get down to what might be triggering the PVC. Is it a structural cause? Is it a non-structural cause? If it's a non-structural cause, is it any of those substances or medications we talked about earlier that we can modify or avoid? So as I mentioned before, PVCs are often asymptomatic. They do not need any treatment. But if they are symptomatic, we can use beta blockers to help reduce the perception of symptoms. And I talked about it before but beta blockers can actually trigger PVCs. So beta blockers are more used for the symptoms of PVCs like palpitations, presyncope. It helps reduce the sensation or the perception of those symptoms. PVCs are often benign, but they can be significant if any of the following occur. If we have at least three consecutive PVCs in a row, it can lead to ventricular tachycardia or VT. Or if a PVC falls on a T wave, which is called an R on T phenomenon, it may induce or elicit ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation as well. So these are two very important scenarios to think about with regards to PVCs, especially when a patient has many PVCs in a row. And although we mentioned that PVCs are benign unless they are due to an underlying structural heart condition or some other condition, the presence of PVCs in patients with normal hearts does seem to be associated with increased mortality. The reason for this may be due to the fact that the PVCs are there because of an unknown underlying cardiac cause or unknown underlying more comorbidity that we just haven't picked up on yet. But presence of PVCs in patients with normal hearts is associated with some increased mortality. But again, most PVCs are benign and occur in a vast majority of the population at some point or another. So when do we want to work them up? So if a patient has frequent or repetitive PVCs, most oftentimes what I mentioned before, if 20% or more of their heart beats
weights are PVCs, we might want to work them up then. And we want to work them up to assess for underlying structural heart disease. We can do this by looking at echocardiograms to assess this. So if we do see frequent repetitive PVCs, we can work them up for an underlying structural heart disease. Otherwise, a lot of times it's benign and we can try to identify and avoid triggers. So in summary, we want to try to identify and avoid triggers of PVCs. As I mentioned before, those three important ones, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, we want to try to avoid those. If a patient is asymptomatic with PVCs, we don't have to do anything with regards to treatment. If they are symptomatic, we can use beta blockers to help reduce symptoms. And if they ha are having frequent and repetitive PVCs, most oftentimes if it's greater than 500 PVCs per day or greater than 20% of their heartbeats are PVCs, we want to work them up for an underlying structural heart disease by looking at an echocardiogram. So if you want to learn other cardiology topics, please check out my cardiology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.